Administration and at the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. Um, if you haven't already, let us know that you're here. Just put your name and institution in the chat box. That way we'll know who we're talking to today and we'd appreciate it. Um, could someone get the next slide for me, please? Thank you. Oh, there we go. And I'm going to introduce right now Meg Phillips, who's the External Affairs Liaison from the National Archives and Records Administration. She'll welcome you on behalf of NARA, and then I'll be back on to welcome you on behalf of COSA. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. And hello, everybody. This is Meg Phillips, External Affairs at the National Archives. Um, as Barbara said, I'm just here to co-host and welcome you on behalf of the National Archives. Um, you probably already know this is part of a series of quarterly calls on archival topics um, co-hosted by the National Archives and COSA to try to strengthen bonds between staff who are interested in similar topics at the federal and state level. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And as always, let us know if there are additional topics you'd like to hear from us about in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Meg. And on behalf of COSA, we're very happy to have NARA participate with us on these quarterly webinars. You know, COSA and NARA uh, learn a lot from each other, and we're happy to share that with those of you who are attending today and who will be listening on a recording later. Um, incidentally, uh, it's very good that we're having a webinar on social media outreach today because today is Electronic Records Day, which is observed by COSA uh, as the the lead organization and sponsored by many other partners around the country and also around the world, apparently. We have a couple of people from some other countries who are paying attention to us, too. Um, so we're happy to have this on Electronic Records Day, and we welcome you here today. Uh, we have some great presenters, um, as you know we would, since we're here on a quarterly webinar with uh, social media experts from um, from both NARA and the Vermont State Archives. And from NARA, we have uh, Hillary Parkinson, who is on the NARA social media team, as well as Mary King from the NARA social media team. They're uh, very good at, at, as those of you who follow the National Archives, and it's many accounts on social media, you know that they really are leaders in sharing information and doing outreach for the archives, not only the National Archives, but the profession. So we're happy to have them here with us today. And we also have from the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, and I may get this wrong, Marisa, Marisa Dobrik, you can, you can correct me if you come on later, and Sally Blanchard O'Brien, who both work on the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration accounts, and they have several accounts there as well. Um, and I'm the moderator currently. <laughs> Lisa Johnston, our administrative coordinator, isn't here yet. so. Uh, Forgive me for stumbling a little bit, and I will just turn it over to the presenters that you really want to hear from. So thank you, Hillary, Mary, and um, uh, Marisa and Sally for being here. As you know, we're welcoming you here, and we're going to have the webinar uh, content from NARA and then the Vermont State Archives, and then we'll have a Q&A period and then a few announcements at the end and also ways that you can contact both the um, National Archives and COSA and the Vermont State Archives. Um, so please pay attention to that at the end. And if you think of questions as we're going along, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box. That's how we'll uh, answer questions during the Q&A. We won't really unmute you as we get there. So we'll just, uh, if you think of anything, type it in. If not, we'll get to you at some point. So I will, without further ado, I will turn it over to Hillary and Mary, and thank you all for being here with us today. Hey everyone, um, happy day. I'm Hillary Parker, me over on the left on top of Times to Spend Stories, and that's uh, Mary on right. and this was actually at a recent comic book insta meet, so that was a lot of fun. Um, so I'm Hillary Parkinson. I work in the Office of Public and Media Communications, and I manage our flag, uh, flagship Facebook and Twitter accounts. And Mary and I will be sharing a presentation that our colleague Jeannie Chen and I gave at Museums in the Web in April. I don't know if anybody 
um, caught that. But we're going to talk about how our monthly hashtag parties, which a lot of state archives participate in. So hello, everyone, and thank you if you participated. Um, we're going to talk about how this party helps us use our digitized holdings to connect with the community. Um, so basically, like, why should you party with us on Twitter and Instagram? And it's because these monthly, monthly events, these monthly parties, will help you forge emotional connections that inspire lasting interest in your organization. And whatever it is that speaks to you, that's what we think of as an emotional connection. And that's what delights our audience about the archive hashtag party. So on the first Friday of every month, we host hashtag party, and we invite cultural institutions and the public to join in and share their collections. Um, their electronic records, digitized collections, on Twitter and Instagram. And we select human interest themes that make it as easy as possible for people to participate. And we at the Archives take our host role very seriously. Um, we try to mingle, make introductions, ask questions, and make connections. And at the end of every first Friday at 4 o'clock, I am exhausted. So from the start, we saw immediate results from this call to action. So organizations and audiences jumped right in, and they wanted to shine a spotlight on their own collections. And we maximized our impact by joining together with outside organizations um, to have a big conversation about our collections that delighted existing audiences, and it also attracted new audiences for us. So here you can hear, you can see some of our themes. Archive Squad Goals was the first one. And the photos and the slides are from the FDR Library on the left, the famous toga party picture. And on the right is from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And that was for the theme Archive Squad Goals. And they chose what resonated for them in their collections. And the audiences laughed, and they learned, and they got a chance to connect with these organizations. Um, you know, everybody likes to have a party and to have fun with their friends. And so this is something that our audiences could relate to. So from togas to tuxedos, each theme is a chance to nerd out on topics that our staff are passionate about. So the Archives Hashtag Party has become one of the flagship social media campaigns for us, but we thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about how we built it from the ground up and how we started this community call to action campaign. We actually had very clear goals from the beginning. They were based on our agency mission and our social media strategy. And if you haven't read it, um, the current one is on GitHub. It is a little bit long, um, and we're working on revising a new one since the current one just goes through 2020. But if you would like to read it, it's there. Um, and our strategy, our social media strategy, is four main pillars. Tell great stories, deepen engagement, grow our audience, and cultivate a community of practice, both internally and externally. And we took these principles and we used them when creating this campaign. So we didn't want to just broadcast to our audience. Um, we really wanted to engage with them and wanted to have them engage with the materials. And we'd already had a lot of success with a similar call to action campaign called Election Collection, um, which you might remember it was from four years ago. And it was very successful with a sort of similar each week. We had a different topic and it was sort of fun and lighthearted. And we were inspired um, you know, by campaigns like Museum Week and Ask a Curator and Five Women Artists where there's a call to action and cultural organization answer with their content. So at first we talked about the campaign as a hashtag challenge, but pretty soon we realized what we really wanted to do is make connections. And we wanted um, to connect with our audience through content that would spark empathy and humor and give them a personal connection with history. And we realized we wanted the campaign to be a gathering place for archives from all types of organizations to hang out and get to know each other better. So really it was going to be a party. So with these goals, we identified our tactics and we started party planning. And we decided we would be good social media citizens in our community. We would make each call to action inclusive and easy to join. So you'll see there aren't really, they're quite broad each, um, Hashtag party theme is very broad. And, uh, and also the graphics for the campaign would be brand agnostic, so organizations could share their own collections. Um, and we don't really, oh, did I jump ahead? Yikes. Sorry, everybody. I'm just talking away. Oh, no, I didn't. Apologies. I got a little nervous there. Um, so, so we don't normally have graphics anymore. What you're seeing here is three ladies, um, which is a funny nod to the craftiness of our uh, social media practitioners here. We also all love to do handicrafts. 
Um, we don't really use graphics anymore, except on special occasions, and you'll see one later in the slideshow. So now we just use images, basically to make it so anybody can use it. It's not specifically branded to us necessarily. Um, and we started with Archive Squad Goals, which is really about friendship as a theme. And most of our themes give a place for joy and nostalgia and another feel-good emotion. And we really wanted to give our internal staff a place to highlight items that didn't give it as much exposure. And we wanted um, our staff at our various locations. We have lots and lots of different handles at presidential libraries and some of our archives that are in the field. They all have their own accounts. So we wanted to give them a place to share some of their fun holdings. So really the whole point of the campaign was to create something to benefit the online archives community and know that we would meet our social strategy goals and benefit from it as well. So now a successful party in real life might meet endless shrimp cocktail if you're me, um, but a successful archives hashtag party might mean goat carts. And we learned about goat carts during archives animals. It's a great example of what I like to call the joy of fellow nerdship. So somebody shared a picture of a kid and a pony, and then someone shared a picture of a kid being pulled in a cart by a kid. And then suddenly lots of people were sharing goat carts in this very long Twitter thread. And of course, we all started wondering, why do we have so many of these pictures? And in the Twitter conversation, it turned out someone had done actual research on this, and they shared the blog, the blog posts, and we learned about the history of goat carts. And, uh, and the audience really loved this sort of like ultra nerdy banter. And the great thing about this is the conversation isn't just limited to big names. The goat cart conversation was a great place for local archives and for history museums to contribute. And so, you know, the parties really bring together a large and small organizations into these conversations. So don't hesitate to lean in. Um, you're asking, could an archive be a place where we can also party? Um, field trip that everybody takes to the archive is hushed and quiet and it's covered in. And so when we started, there was concern maybe like a party for the Maybe it wouldn't be on brand to host a campaign that featured adorable cats. But really, by using these human interest themes, we were forging emotional connections with our audience. And that meant we were connecting with our customers, and in turn, they were inspired you know, inspired to explore our holdings. And that meant we were really meeting our agency's mission goals of greater access. And, you know, as we got started doing these, we, um, we also heard from our peers by email telling us they saw increased growth and engagement when they participated. So we were creating a new community of practice. And inside the National Archives, we had found this common project that our staff were excited to participate in. So even though it was cats and the internet, deeper things were at work. And we knew that we had quelled the fears of our leadership when the Archivist of the United States sent me a picture of himself as a child with his beloved kitten Blackie for Archives Animals, and he asked me to post it on Twitter. All right, so now I'm going to pass this over to Mary, or she'll become the presenter. Everyone, I'm Mary King. I do work with Hillary in the Office of Public and Media Communications, and I manage our flagship Instagram account. Um, so now let's talk about the secret sauce of the hashtag party. While the archives hashtag party is a fun campaign, it's actually built on the framework of our mission, goals, and social media strategy. This is the secret sauce that makes it meaningful to the staff who work on it. Our staff are passionate about the records they work with, and they know the gems in our collections that are often overlooked. This campaign mixes that passion with providing access, building community, and creating a high tide that lifts many boats. It's fun, and it's authentic to our mission. So here's a snapshot of how we map the pillars of our social media strategy to the mechanics of this campaign. All of these social media strategy pillars are built upon NARA's goal to connect with customers by cultivating public participation Place NARA out in front as we lead the social media glam community with this campaign. So to aid the mechanics and production for this campaign, the first thing we did was assemble a team with defined roles. Jeannie Chen in the Office of Presidential Libraries serves as our fearless project manager and as our liaison for the presidential libraries. Hillary, of course, is our mastermind behind Twitter content 
I develop the Instagram posts and stories, and Kristen Albritton in Public and Media Communications is the participant's welcome wagon when they join the campaign. She's also our tech person behind the web updates. So the four of us at the beginning of the month after the, the last campaign will map out our themes and try to choose a topic that anyone can participate in. We want the hashtag party themes to create a balance with some of our more serious historical topics, so the campaigns tend to be a little bit more lighthearted, and this gives us the chance to show the smaller, more everyday moments that can be found in our holdings that we don't often get to talk about. We have a dual approach for reaching our community. Each month we send an email that includes qualitative and quantitative highlights from last month's party and a clear call to action and date for the next campaign. The emails have an important job that hints at the voice and tone for the next hashtag party, and we relish the chance to create all the puns. So think lots of branching out and growing and last bud, not leaf puns in our archives and bloom email. We also share the successes from the previous month's party, as well as a specific note that we're sharing metrics with our community organizations so they can pass them along to their management and show how beneficial it is to participate in this campaign. As each month has passed, we see more and more organic growth for the hashtag parties. People are tagging other orgs who are not officially in the party yet and striking up conversations with them, like in this Jansen swimsuit exchange where the North Carolina Maritime Museum shared this advertisement and then the Truman Library was able to identify that these were the same swim trunks that President Truman wore, uh, which was a very fun and interesting conversation to watch unfold on Twitter. We're also seeing this organic growth in an email sent to us requesting to be added to our participants page. This particular organization had heard of the hashtag parties at a conference, which is not actually an unusual occurrence if you've been to a conference with one of us lately. Um, but what made this email particularly exciting was that the conference mentioned was one that none of us had attended. Um, and finally, at the end of each hectic hashtag party, we make an effort to come together as a group and reflect on what happened, how the day went, what worked, what surprised us, and analyze the metrics. We also include these observations in our email that we share each month. Community is central to the goals and success of this party. A great example of this was with Archives 80s. On 8818, we hosted an 80s party across the century. We invited eight organizations to co-host with us and share their own collections from the 80s of any century. As you can tell, we really like to double down on our theme. And this is one of the graphics that Hillary mentioned earlier that uh, was a rare occasion for us to develop a graphic again to you. Um, on the surface, it was a catchy hook with lots of 80s hair jokes, but in fact, it was a day where organizations were able to converse with audiences about the fascinating range of their collections. There were maps, patents, photographs, illustrations, historic advertisements, you name it. We had folks sharing records from the 1980s, 1880s, 1780s, it kind of became a scavenger hunt throughout the day to find the earliest records, which we think the FDR library got the unofficial honors with a book from 1480. So we always prep loads of content for our Instagram and Twitter accounts ahead of time so that on the day of the party, we can focus on mingling. Unlike a lot of our other campaigns, the big draw of these parties is seeing organizations respond to each other, feed off each other, spur the moment ideas, and try to one up each other. Not a party goes by that doesn't see some sort of, hey, organization, We'll see your record and raise you one of our own. Audiences always remark how much they learn during these parties. They ask questions, they link to their own collections, and they tell us they can't wait for the next one. So working together with co-hosts allows us to cross-pollinate ideas and expand that audience discovery across organizations. Our awesome co-hosts have included NASA, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Smithsonian Folk Lake Festival, the Murrell, which is the Museum of English Rural Life, and more. For several of our bigger co-hosted parties, we sought out partners that we thought might have a good number of relevant records to share and who already had a history of high user engagement on their social accounts. A win for this campaign came in October 2018 when NASA sought us out as a partner for Archives in Space to celebrate their 60th birthday. This demonstrated that other organizations see the value of getting involved, recognize that this is an actionable community, and want to come to us to promote a big anniversary or theme that they're already working on. After each party, we crunch the data and create a one-page report to show the impact of the party. Since we launched the campaign, over 1,000 organizations have answered our call to action. 
the number in the slide is slightly off. Um, a large group of these folks return each month to share and discuss our combined collections. We often see handles tweeting out announcements leading up to a party that say something like, it's time for another archives hashtag party. This month we're celebrating whatever the new theme is. Um, there's a real feeling of joint ownership now that's fun to see. And it's a very democratic party. We take all comers. It's been really cool to see new categories of organizations join as new hashtags are announced. One of our main goals, again, is to inspire as many cultural and educational organizations as possible to join in and feel like they belong. So Archives Animals brought in zoos, Archives in Bloom introduced us to new friends at Botanical Gardens, and with Archives Road Trip, we visited with national parks and historic sites. Groups that might not have thought they had much to contribute to a big campaign keep finding where they fit in the constantly evolving mini campaign series that make up this larger party. Even if it's not something the public sees, the stats are a big part of the strategy for us. They help us decide on new hashtags. They help demonstrate value to leadership. They make the stats, to make the stats as high impact and low barrier as possible, we use the same metrics each month so you can go back and compare over time. We always include both quantitative stats and qualitative audience feedback to ensure we're telling a story and not just providing data. We've seen that campaigns that forge emotional connections inspire lasting interest in our organizations. And leveraging that, leveraging that connection has been successful on a campaign reporting level, but it's also really created this community of practice made up of people excited about maybe showing a more human side of archives. We like to tell people, no RSVP required, but it's BYOA, bring your own archives. So uh, that's it for us today. Um, thank you for inviting us to come chat about the archives hashtag party. Um, we're going to be hanging out by the punch bowl and would love to talk with anyone after the other presentation um, and answer any questions or talk about ideas. Please feel free to suggest future themes and if you're interested in co-hosting a future party, just let us know. We're always excited to work with new organizations and learn from your collections and expertise. Um, we've included the email addresses for our whole team on the slide. Um, but if there is one that you want to write down, um, which of course is not on the slide, it would be socialmedia at nara.gov. That's the best way to kind of get all of us at one time. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Marisa Dobrik. This is Marisa Dobrik. Um, I'm one of the archivists at Fasara. And today, Sally and I will show how we've created a vibrant online presence with a small staff. We're also big fans of the archives hashtag party ourselves. And we'll talk about how we use that in a small state as well. We use Twitter to promote the importance of archives. Since Vermont is very small and our staff is just two who run the Twitter uh, feed, Twitter has led to a more public recognition of the Sara. And that's what we look like. <laughs> and we called our presentation Tweet All About It Using Twitter to Promote the Importance of Archives. We also like a good pun. This is the agenda of our presentation today. We'll talk about how we got started using Twitter, our strategies for success using the platform, how we make our brand, uh, balancing our interactions with the public, especially in politically charged situations. How to redirect when someone asks a question that goes beyond 280 characters. We will also discuss some of the tools you can use within the Twitter platform outside of it. And we'll conclude our presentation with tips and tricks you've picked up along the way. Getting started. Uh, what do you do if all of this is new to you? I'm going to admit uh, Twitter was initially very terrifying for me. Um, I'm pleased to report that now posting is an enjoyable part of my job. We had a very solid foundation and that was our social media policy. Having that policy and following the Secretary of State's policy laid out who had access to the accounts, responsibilities, and of course, because we're records managers, that records are public record under Vermont state law, managed according to our transitory and routine correspondence schedule. 
Twitter was actually very new to us in 2016. We like to joke that Vermont wasn't quite sure about joining the 21st century, but we're happy to be here now. Um, we were a little overwhelmed when we began. So getting started meant taking a leap into the unknown for us. It can be helpful in our case, we started with State Archivist Tanya Marshall kind of got us started and used the platform. Then a senior archivist took over and then eventually each of us had a different Twitter day for us because we don't have our own individual social media team. Everybody here does a little bit of everything. Currently, Sally and I manage our Twitter account together and our roving archivist, Rachel Onoff, has her own separate account. I'm going to go into a few of the strategies for success we have throughout the next few slides. We promote our collections and the importance of archives through event promotion and occasional live tweets, tie-ins with commemorative days and hashtags. And of course, we successfully use the archives hashtag party to our advantage. We tag other state agencies when we use records related to their mission. And we also follow current trends and occasionally give people a behind the scenes glimpse of life at Vasara. Event promotion. It's Archives Month, as everyone knows, and Twitter has been a boon for event promotion for us. It allows us to share flyers and information about upcoming events. We also do teaser tweets going out about a week in advance of an event. Um, these were tweets in advance of our 10th anniversary in June 2018 and former state archivist and the former uh, governor. And then also for our Raising Spirits event last October, that was so successful, we're doing a repeat event of Raising Spirits Encore presentation. We also use tweets as sneak peeks of the records that will be part of an exhibit or referenced in a talk. So we can kind of run up to the week, we can show off some of our newspapers or other records and holdings. Themes, as, as Hillary and Mary mentioned, themes are a very big part um, and the hashtag party is a big part of that. Matching themes is one way to get some attention when social media speed whizzes past at a very fast pace. When we first started, we had a social media plan that laid out some of our strategies and tricks to do as we got it our bearing. We still use an internal calendar where we compile interesting commemorative months, major events in state history, or just some of the most unusual days you might not have thought of. There are hundreds of national days every year. They're compiled online, or sometimes hashtag themes already follow them, and they're great for tweeting. This national paperclip day got a lot of sympathetic appreciation from colleagues from all over. We also make liberal use of Twitter tags like Way Back Wednesday or Friday Feeling. We pour the most energy into the National Archives hashtag parties that were just discussed. The monthly First Friday themes are our opportunity to shine. We find taking a little extra time to prepare for a hashtag party is worth it in these followers and enhanced interaction from all over. The themes tend to be broad and easy to find records that meet the theme. In September, the theme was archives inventions, and we had fun selecting these dapper clothing pin gentlemen, highlighting Montpelier's old clothing factory, clothes pin factory. We also tag other state agencies on Twitter when we highlight historic records that originated in the office or its predecessors. For example, the state police have been highlighting traffic safety, and we tagged them with a photo showing a highway safety campaign from the 1950s. Some of our videos were turned into a GIF and we used that one for National Road Trip Day. The other one is from the state park and very popular CCC park plans that we can highlight. Current trends can help a lot with visibility, especially like us when you're getting started or when you don't always get a lot of attention. National days are all over and we have everything from National Book Lovers Day on August 9th to the very important Teacher Appreciation Day on May 7th. We also look for trending topics. Angelo's bachelor party was probably one of our most popular ones last year in the last year and it was pretty hilarious. Someone named Will Novak accidentally got invited from the West Coast to a 1980s ski theme bachelor party in Vermont. The invention was, uh, invitation was meant for another Will Novak, but he decided to come anyway, and he shared his adventures on Twitter. 
We happen to have some very excellent 1980s ski Vermont tourism brochures and shared tips for a perfect 1980s ski weekend. This was attached to a very viral topic. It was lighthearted and fun, but it gave us a chance to share our tourism records and the importance of skiing industry in Vermont's history. And then we also, about every day of the week, there's a hashtag that lends itself well to archival holdings. Things like Monday motivation, Tuesday thought, Friday feeling, way back Wednesday. It allows us to highlight photos and records that might match even broadly that kind of thing. In honor of our eighth anniversary, when we first started Twitter in 2016, we tweeted a behind the scenes under the hashtag life at Gazzara. It received a lot of positive feedback. Occasionally, we still highlight some of these things that might be unique to our job behind the scenes in our building, a sneak glance at our shelves, highlighting construction projects, just the day-to-day -day running of our archives. In fact, we use this the opportunity for ELEX Day to highlight our digital processing workstation. And this, I think, also allows us to show some of our humanity. Making your brand. When creating a Twitter presence, you may want to ask these questions to make your Twitter brand. What are your institution's strengths? What is the official brand and mission of your repository? Who is your target audience? How much staff time can you dedicate to Twitter? The reference staff decided to go with what people knew about Vermont and try to share new and surprising things every day. Our brand was to be the good humored archivist, sharing our passion for records by highlighting records with enduring value that could be valuable and fun. I admit we do tend to highlight maple syrup an inordinate amount, but Vermont maple is one of the things that might hook people into Vermont in the beginning. Um, these are just some of the things that we've done, and Sally is going to continue this conversation. Thank you, Marisa. So, after you've done all of that work to craft your tweet, where do you go from there? What happens after the tweet has been posted? The point of social media is that it's interactive. It's meant to be engaged with. It's not a static thing. So how do you interact with other users and content? We interact with other Twitter users primarily through liking their posts and comment threads on the posts. Most of our interactions happen during those special days and events that we've described, such as Ask an Archivist Day and Archives Hashtag Parties. With liking, we usually like content that's connected to our institution, so tweets that showcase archives or government records or Vermont history, not just stuff that we as individuals personally like. You are representing your institution and not yourself. And usually, we don't start comment threads. We comment in direct response to a comment or question that has been made on one of our posts. With commenting, it's important to keep it neutral. For us in the government sector, we can't be political with our comments or responses. We want to keep it light but professional. Remember, again, you are representing your institution and not yourself. Sometimes difficult situations arise with comments left on our tweets. The situations that come up the most for us are negative or politically charged responses or what could be considered reference questions. We have examples of each for you here on the slide. When it comes to the politically charged comments, we leave them alone. We ignore it, but we don't delete it. Twitter and other social media platforms are intended to be a public forum, and so the comment generally has a right to be there. However, we don't have to engage with the behavior or continue the conversation. When people ask questions relating to records in our holdings, we respond by encouraging them to go through the appropriate channel to contact our reference room, which is equipped to deal with the more intensive research questions. It's also important to keep track of the impact of your Twitter presence in order to justify the value of social media in your organization's outreach program. Twitter has its own analytics component that can help you track certain statistics over time, such as number of tweets posted, new followers, mentions of your Twitter account in other tweets, direct visits to your profile, and tweet impressions, which is the total number of all the time the tweet has been seen. So for example, on our slide, you can see that in May of this year, our tweets were seen 41,000 times. This doesn't mean that they were interacted with that many times, it just means that they were seen that many times. 
Twitter provides statistics by month and also shows how the numbers have changed from the previous month, which you can see in the charts at the top. It's very easy to find the analytics function. While logged into Twitter, you click on more on the left-hand menu and then choose the analytics option. There's also a way to connect Google Analytics if your organization uses it to your Twitter account and other social media accounts to track other statistics. As of now, we do not use Google Analytics with our Twitter account, but we're kind of talking about it. And another great tool to help you get the most out of your Twitter account is to use TweetDeck. This is a dashboard application that helps you manage your Twitter account. It allows you to view your Twitter activity in different ways. So you can create your own custom dashboard with columns of the types of activity that you want to track, such as likes or mentions. You can even filter by certain hashtags you want to that you want to track, maybe like the archives hashtag party theme. But perhaps the best use for TweetDeck is the scheduling feature. So this is something that we use frequently. You can schedule your tweets ahead of time to post at a future date and hour. As we have a small staff managing our Twitter account, this feature is especially useful for us. We all have a million other things to do than manage our Twitter, our Twitter accounts, but with the scheduling feature, you can plan ahead and create posts when you have time. Then when you're busy with your other duties as assigned, your tweet will just post itself. This is also great for when you know you have vacations or holidays coming up. You can schedule your tweets and they'll still post even when you're out of the office. It can also help keep you organized. You can see what sorts of items are coming up in the queue so you don't repeat a tweet. Or if you plan on doing several tweets in a day, like for an event, hashtag party for example, uh, you can plan ahead, pick an order to show uh, to how you want your tweets to roll out and balance the type of content that you're sharing. And best of all, TweetDeck is free, good news. <laughs> it used to be a separate third-party app but was acquired by Twitter and it's fully integrated. You can just visit the website seen here and log in with the same credentials that you use for your Twitter account. Keeping your Twitter active and vibrant can really have a ripple effect and expand beyond the confines of your social media account. Using our Twitter analytics, we've been able to find what our most popular tweets were in a given period and highlight them in other ways, such as a fun piece in our newsletter. Sometimes popular tweets take on a life of their own. One of our tweets shown here, a festive pre-holiday visit from our former state archivist, Gregory Sanford, took off and was featured as the tweet of the week in a popular local newspaper seven days. Our Twitter presence was even noticed by the local broadcast media. Our local ABC Fox affiliate interviewed one of our former archivists during a local morning news segment. During that segment, they discussed our Twitter feed, but the conversation turned to the importance of archives in general, which really helps recognition for our institution and for archives as a whole. And of course, promoting your events on social media helps get people into the brick and mortar of your institution, interacting with archives in person and away from the Twitter sphere and from the computer in general, Using social media can be a door that provides more recognition and appreciation for the archives world that expands and diversifies the way people interact with your institution and archival records. So we'd like to share some of our tips and tricks for you to take away as you think about creating and developing your own Twitter presence. Firstly, it can be a good idea to have a ready stash of material to use for Twitter. Again, this is a time saver. Come across something interesting while doing your day-to-day -day work, scan it and save it for later. Or if you're looking to scan something specific to share, why not scan a few extra related things that you can use in the future? We often do this when we're getting ready for a hashtag party. We scan more than we need, we use a few, and then we keep the rest as a stash for future tweets. This stash can also be a good idea generator when you're not sure what to tweet on a given day. Don't spend too much time planning out your post. It really should take about 15 minutes at the most. This is because, as we like to put it, careful curation does not always mean success. Certain things will just grab people's attention and catch on, and it could be the most random thing. We spent time carefully researching something and tying it into major themes in a very beautiful and elegant way, and later realized it didn't get that much attention, while another tweet selected from a ready stock of scanned photos, for example, just took off like wildfire. The key is to keep it relatable, but don't stress about having the perfect tweet. And one tweet a day is fine. With a small staff, that's all we can commit to, though, as we mentioned, we do a few more during special events like Ask an Archivist and hashtag parties. The important thing is to just remain consistently active. 
do take advantage of the other hashtags out there related to trending topics, special themes, and commemorative days. This is what helps your tweet be visible. And it also gives you an idea of what to tweet when you may not have any. Don't be afraid to try new things. Is there a new trending hashtag that you'd like to see if you can get any traction with it? Try it. And don't be afraid to let go of what's not working. We had a hashtag that we used regularly for a while, but when we saw it wasn't getting much attention, we stopped using it and tried some others. Only measure your own progress. This is true in life in general, but don't compare yourself to others. Perhaps your tweet didn't get as many likes as Kim Kardashian's. Well, that's too bad, but did you get more likes on tweets this month than last? That's progress. Only compare your stats against yourself, not with other larger institutions or organizations that have maintained a Twitter presence longer than you have. And don't forget to have fun. Interacting with your users in this way can be very exciting. But remember, in government, it can be an official channel of communication, so have fun, but keep it professional. And that is about all we have for you. So we'd love to hear with our contact information, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions after today. We'd love to hear from you. Presentation and the presentations for all of our speakers, for Mary and Hillary as well. So now we have some time for questions. So if we have uh, any questions about the presentation, now's your chance. Type it into chat. So we'll get, have a few minutes for that. But while we're waiting for you to type in your questions, um, I've got one for Mary and Hillary. All okay? right. Do you guys see any variations of the hashtag party theme that you choose? So let me we see have, if I can get... um, I... Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi, this is Mary again. Um, we've definitely seen some variations. I mean, let's see um, how our participants are creative and spin the, that themes into something that fits with their content. And I think one um, one example that I'm thinking of was archives in bloom. We were, like, you know, our we had pitched it as a hashtag party for spring with flowers, and you know, you know, it was new life at spring, and um, we saw an archives bloomer spinoff conversation, which connected Betty Ford's maiden name, which is Bloomer. Um, to, and her connection to ERA and the importance of bloomers to women's rights. So it was like a little rabbit hole of a, a spin-off hashtag party during the archives in Bloom one, which is great. Neat. Um, so you, you never know where your hashtags are going to lead. It can actually create a, a, a really major ripple effect. Yes, and, it, and that's one of the reasons why we like to have such open hashtags so that really anyone can participate and whether or not you might have something for archives road trip or not, there, maybe there's something in your, your holdings that you can kind of jigsaw in and fit however you can. Yeah, great. Thanks. I see we have Ashley, a question from Lori please, please. Ashley. Yeah. Okay, I see we have a question from Lori Ashley. It says, to whom do you report your metrics? Which stakeholders are interested in your activities and success? And have you seen this engagement change over time? Wow, those are great questions. All right, who wants, who wants to hit that one first? Um, this is Hillary. Um, this is I think that we, we have a little report that's created at the end of each hashtag party, and we send it on up to um, to our leadership team so that they always can see sort of at a glance a one-page report how well it's done. All and right. This is Sally um, from us. Yeah, Sally, go ahead. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, for us right now, we're it's fairly informal. It's kind of keeping track for ourselves so we can kind of gear up for um, you know other events and other things in the future. But we do uh, kind of keep it localized. We report it to our management. Um, it hasn't really gone beyond that at that at this point. Um, but it's more kind of our our own metrics for our own success and just to keep us motivated as we're going forward. Okay, great. Anybody else have any other comments? Okay, well, we have another great question here, too. Uh, for all of the panelists, approximately how many other staff help you gather content 
and how do you request assistance? So I'm going to turn to Mary and Hillary first. So can you guys share with us on that? Sure. So um, as far as gathering content, Hillary manages the Twitter account, so she's primarily responsible for um, content, not just for the hashtag parties on Twitter, but for the rest of you know, her posts on Twitter. Um, I manage the Instagram account, and so similarly, I do the hashtag party content for Instagram as well as regular content. Um, and we often will send things back and forth to each other that we think might work on each other's platform um, and kind of back each other up if there's anyone out or um, like an extra busy day that we need some help. Great. Um, all right, Sally and Marisa. And we have a, a good. Okay, great. Um, Sally so and Marisa. The, thank you. Currently, it's Marisa. Um, at Vasara, there's just the two of us that pretty much do a little bit of everything. So there's two staff that really gather the content. I think we end up talking back and forth to each other a fair amount, especially if it's a topic that we need a little extra help with. So um, sometimes we will ask other staff members if there's something that they really think would be exciting, but we're the best equipped to know our holdings right now. So we tend to have um, just the two of us. And it's just the two of us for reference and processing in a lot of instances too. So we're, we kind of keep busy. Great. Um, okay, well, um, well, while we wait to see if there are any more questions coming in on chat, I have one more for Sally and Marisa. What elements have you included in a social media plan or policy? So this is Sally. Um, the biggest pieces that we've had included, and of course we, this, we, we are kind of the recipients of this. You know, we, uh, we're the staff members who uh, implement the plan. So um, a lot of the decisions were kind of made above us. Um, but the big pieces were who are the authorized users for the account, um, engagement strategies, so kind of how to roll it out as, uh, you know, as you're getting, uh, getting on board a new platform, how are you going to roll it out, how are you going to make people um, know about it and in that sense. Um, Content strategy, so how frequently are you posting? What sorts of materials are you including? Um, citizen conduct, what is happening uh, with comments and how are you dealing with those interactions um, on the, the platform? Uh, the measures and the analytics and um, how to deal with kind of third party or external links, which could be seen as endorsement. Um, so those are kind of the big, the big ones that we hit on. Excellent. Thank you. Um, those have all been great questions, and, and, and you guys, thank you guys so much for sharing your expertise on this. Um, I don't see any more questions, so if we don't have any more questions, we'll just continue on. And just remind you that we always want you to stay connected. Now, I will tell you that this slide is missing a huge one for the NARA people. Uh, we do need to include their NARA Instagram account, which is the same as their Twitter handle, which is at US Nat Archives. So uh, again, lots of ways to stay connected with our NARA friends and the social media uh, people. Uh, and then, of course, for the COSA people, we have also a great way of connecting with everyone. Uh, and we hope you will use all of those to stay in touch and stay informed. And with that, we really do appreciate all your feedback. So another big round of applause for our presenters today. Thank them for sharing their time and expertise with us on social media and Instagram and Twitter and all that great stuff. And so we hope you'll join us again and happy Electronic Records Day to everybody. We do appreciate your feedback. So when you exit the webinar, please take a minute and do this, the uh, webinar evaluation. It really helps our education committee as they put together future webinars and uh, find topics, uh, what was useful, what wasn't. So we really do use that feedback. So it's not just one of those annoying things that are tacked on at the end of a presentation, but it's, it's valuable information for us. So we, we really appreciate that. And with that, I appreciate everyone today, 
and we will thank you for attending our COSANARA quarterly webinar. We have another one coming up in December, so stay tuned and we'll keep you posted on that. And with that, thank you everyone for attending today and we'll all talk to you soon. Thanks so much.